Let's bring in our next guest. Joshua Eisenman is a professor of politics at the University of Notre Dame, where he focuses on China and Africa's relation. Uh, great to have you with us. As we continue to see, as Steve just told us, rising concerns and also criticism about the so-called debt trap from China. Uh, where do you see this relationship going and what this conference can do? Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I mean, I think the first thing we have to do is step back and recognize from the 50,000 foot level, this is a really important conference. It's one of the first big conferences that China is holding out of uh, COVID. And it, the last uh, FOCAC conference held in Senegal was almost an entirely online affair. So now we've got 53 African heads of state in China meeting with Xi Jinping um, and, you know, under this banner of the community of shared future, that's the name of the conference, the, the building a high level China Africa community with the shared future in many ways set up in juxtaposition to uh, what we in the West call the rules based order. So from a, a, a kind of a larger perspective, um, what China is trying to do here is suggest that it offers an alternative world order that countries in the global South and African countries can gain from. And the question is, is that necessarily the case based on the package you've just put forward? I think that's a, a question right now. Um, and so China's trying to kind of address some of those questions that it's put out there, particularly as it's looking itself for markets and Africans are looking to deal with this trade deficit issue, um, as well as loan issues, uh, which, as you mentioned, are, are particularly problematic. But we shouldn't forget that they're also problematic on the Chinese side. Having lent so much money, China now has to at least recoup some of it. And so there are really pressures on both sides of the relationship. Yeah, so how much progress has Beijing, in fact, made when it comes to not only purely commercial uh, relationships with African leaders, but also just the ideological leadership of the global south? And, and how much progress has it made in propagating that idea? Well, I, I think quite a bit, actually. I mean, China has really prioritized Africa from a, in a political sense, which is um, they have a large amount of effort to cultivate what they call people-to-people -people relations, whether that be educational relationships, whether that be uh, on the diplomatic side or party-to-party -party relations, which they really put a lot of effort into the Communist Party of China's efforts to engage African political parties. So they really do put a lot of emphasis, and you can see it through this conference, um, that they're really trying to build out the political relationship and, and on the military side as well. Um, China has arms sales to Africa. China's helping African countries uh, launch satellites. Um, and there's a variety of, of cooperative engagements on the uh, political side, uh, which really uh, help to lend credibility to China's approach. Because while the West, especially the United States, does not prioritize Africa, China goes out of its way to do so, um, including the first trip every year being from the foreign minister. So these are powerful signals. And when you see send them to a region which has been dejected uh, by the West uh, for a long time, it, they can be quite effective. In many ways, China is trying to cultivate this global sufferers club with itself as the kind of leader of that club. And um, a lot of these comments actually are received quite well because, you know, you're dealing with the Africa continent where the, the fathers of, and sometimes the, the leaders themselves actually have an experience with colonialism. It's not uh, all that far in the past. And so China's uh, approach to saying, hey, we're offering something different, this mm -hmm. community, uh, I think it does have some resonance on the continent. But the question is, I think at this point, um, given the challenges we're seeing on the economic side, the sustainability question of whether or not China can really continue to lend money to a continent that is really, in many cases, kind of full up with loans. Um, and then the question of whether China is going to open its markets more to African goods. I think this is just remains an issue. Right. Um, yeah, Joshua, I do wonder how appealing, how attractive that ideological overture is if it doesn't go hand in hand with the continued sort of amount of largesse when it comes to debt, right? If, if China doesn't, if Beijing doesn't uh, shift its positioning on debt refinancing, for example, or debt forgiveness, do you think that relationship could cool? 
I mean, I think that's a major issue right now. And, you know, right now the discussion is about what smart and beautiful projects, right? Um, which basically means less money for more projects. But the problem has always been an issue of due diligence. Um, it's hard to do due diligence even under the best of circumstances. We shouldn't forget the Chinese economy itself is facing massive local deficits, um, you know, in the trillions that far outstrip anything from the Belt and Road. So one could argue if they haven't done it well at home, would they necessarily do a good job uh, in Africa? Africa and other places, and, and arguably they haven't. And now the question is, what comes next, right? You you obviously cannot continue to lend money the way they have. China um, just this year finally ticked up its lending to Africa for the first time since 2016. So um, the question is, what comes next here? And, and I, I do agree with you. I'm not sure um, that you can have a robust political relationship if the economic relationship is fundamentally unbalanced, um, especially these trade deficits. And you know, we in the West are used to trade deficits. Deficits. But when you look at a country like Kenya, Ethiopia, you're looking at 90, 95, 96 percent of trade coming from China. And that kind of trade deficit isn't even anything we experience in the West. So I think these problems on the economic side will continue. Well, that's the thing, right? If uh, <laughs> the criticism would be that if you take a look at uh, the trade relationship, the exporting of not just goods, but also services and, uh, and manufacturing jobs, how does that differ to, you know, the, the criticism, as you say, of that colonial past? I mean, I think this is a really potent point, right? For many years, we've been hearing that China is going to move production to Africa, that it's going to create special economic zones, and that production is going to shift to these kind of low-cost producers. But that really isn't what we've seen, and I don't think it's what we're going to see um, for a variety of reasons. One, because wage levels are not the only driver, right? You need a consistent uh, uh, source of electricity. You need to have ports. You need to have a whole infrastructure established. And China has really created an amazing infrastructure for manufacturing. Um, so it's hard to imagine large scale manufacturing moving to Africa. So if China wants to sell its EVs and other environmentally friendly goods, which are being locked out of the European American markets, well, then it has to look to places like Africa. And the question is how much more bandwidth does Africa have to consume more Chinese products when they themselves would prefer to export more product to China. So I think there really is a kind of tension here as China's looking to unload this excess capacity, especially in, in environmental goods, solar panels, things that we have tariffs on in the United States. Um, where are those things going to go? And I think the question is, can they go to Africa? And it seems to a limited degree. Uh, that being said, China has done a great job in the cell phone market, um, e even in terms of social media. They paid a lot more attention to the African consumer than Western companies have done. So I think it's a mixed bag. Joshua Eisenman, really great to have you with us. He's a professor of politics at the University of Notre Dame.